you can get plenty of review material off of social media, and lately I've been seeing a bunch of tweets about a certain Muppet sitcom. So, just to satisfy my curiosity, we're looking at Dinosaurs, the TV series. <laughs> This is another show that I knew of growing up, but never actually saw. I was more into Family Matters and the occasional Full House, but Dinosaurs was a sitcom whose characters were either puppets or people in costumes. The idea came from Jim Henson, who wanted to do such a show for a while, but it wouldn't come to fruition until the burgeoning popularity of The Simpsons, and after Henson's death in 1990. The show first aired on ABC in April of 1991. It would last for four seasons and 65 episodes. In any case, like The Simpsons, Dinosaurs was meant to be a parody of human life, but apparently it's also a parody to American sitcoms as a genre. Not surprising, considering the Jim Henson Company is known for using puppets to spoof or satirize various things in culture. But why doesn't this show get talked about more, and how did it die off the way it did? Let's go back in time and find out. Now, much like any sitcom, we mainly focus on one family of characters and have dedicated character development episodes for each person. In the case of the first episode, The Mighty Megalosaurus, we're introduced to the Sinclair family, comprised of Earl, voiced by Stuart Packin, his wife Fran, voiced by Jessica Walter, their children, Robbie and Charlene, voiced by Jason Willinger and Sally Struthers, respectively, and of course, Baby, voiced by Kevin Clash. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get to you later. This episode is partially here to explain where the baby came from, but it also shows us the dinosaurs' lifestyle. Their culture is very hands-on, like Earl pushing down trees with his own strength, but one can see some similarities with our way of life. No story, give me that back. Once upon a time, dinosaurs didn't have families. They lived in the woods and ate their children, and it was a golden age. <laughs> then what? Well, in one day, not very long ago, Daddy Dinosaurs and Mommy Dinosaurs started getting married and living in houses and raising children. So, nothing like the land before time. Or even the good dinosaur? Actually, I'm not too far off with the good dinosaur thing. But anyway, back to the episode plot. Earl is stressed that he has to do so much work for everyone on a small paycheck. So, his co-workers suggest talking to their boss for a raise. Said boss is B.P. Richfield, an executive for We Say So, a mega corporation responsible for the necessities of the dino world. Hmm, must be spoofing the fact we let corporations run our lives. Earl tries to reason with his boss, but of course he's too scared. 20 years you work here, I never would have figured you had it in you to come in here and take me on. But take me on you do, mano a mano, one on one. That's Guts Ball Sinclair. I like a guy who plays Guts Ball. Like it! I should also mention that most of the characters in this show are named after fuel companies. Sinclair was one, BP, British Petroleum, was another, etc, etc. Also, Richfield is voiced by Sherman Hemsley. You know, the animal-loving neighbor from that corny video about responsibility? Negotiations break down, and Earl's day couldn't be going worse. And then he comes home to learn that Fran has produced an egg. A really large egg. That better be breakfast. At this point, Earl is in his midlife crisis, and decides to go out into the woods to live life the way dinosaurs used to. No beds, no blankets, always hunting for the next meal, who are all sentient. I have to question what sort of evolutionary path these animals have taken, or why this little critter, who escaped being dinner earlier, is contemplating suicide now that his home was destroyed. To be a tree here and I lived in it with my family. Now some idiot knocked over these trees. I know my insurance doesn't cover that. What? Anyway, please vent, Earl. Family's one of civilization's worst ideas. 
You support them, you give them all your money. You put food on the table? No offense there, Rizik. Yeah, none taken. And what do they do for you? They get you fired from the only thing you were ever good at. And I've done you a favor there, Rizik. Because now, without your family, you're wild and untamed and free. Huh? Look, Earl, maybe I've just got a different perspective from my place in the food chain. What do you mean? Well, if I was a big dinosaur like you and everybody respected me and listened to me, everybody listens to you, right? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Well, yeah. then maybe I wouldn't need a family. But to tell you the truth, my family's all that listens to me. My house is the only place in the world where I'm the boss. This is a weird lesson. It seems to suggest that you're only worthy if you have a family. I assume friends are an option. But at most, I just see this scene as, why go back to a life of solitude when you have a warm bed to come home to? And despite Fran possibly not understanding Earl's frustrations earlier, she came all the way out here to lure Earl with her Mastodon surprise. I could have made it out here. Of course, dear. So, what's for dessert? Chocolate hippo cake at home. Ooh. And because he decided to spare Arthur, the... Whatever Muppet you are, Arthur becomes Richfield's personal assistant for this one episode. This means Earl gets a pay raise, and just in time too, as the baby hatches shortly after. Ta -da! Ah! Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, I'm on the floor. <sighs> that might lead to trouble. So far, I will say that any laughs I got came from the way the dinosaur animatronics move and function. But there are some good lines here and there. The size of Earth is heading towards us in a collision course that will result in the extinction of all life on this planet. This just in? No, it's not. Mm. Hey, lady, you might want to see this. Well, Arlene, we've got 700,000 left, and at the rate they're going... Mm. You really should ask me about my day, Earl. Look, friend, I say this with all love and everything, but... I don't give a damn about your day. This was a joint production between the Jim Henson Company and Michael Jacobs Productions. And the animatronic work allows for more facial expressions than what earlier Muppet suits would allow. These help the characters stand out amongst each other, but some of them feel a bit... uncanny. I don't know. I like a lot of them, especially Earl, but characters like the baby feel off to me. Must be the coloration. I should also mention that Jim Henson was working on a feature film called The Natural History Project, which would have used animatronic dinosaurs had it not been cancelled. I assume whatever was being used there would later inspire the show. Okay, so with the premise of this show down pat, it's just a matter of where they go with it. Some shows, like Family Matters, would continue showcasing each family member in some way while also building story continuity. Does this one do the same? Yes, but it is a steady progress since most episodes tend to feel self-contained. The second episode, The Mating Dance, shows Fran feeling overworked from having another baby, on top of having kids who don't appreciate her. Of course, in regards to Baby Sinclair... It's the middle of the night. Why don't you sleep? No concept of time. Why to wait? Let's dance. Is it wrong to say that Steve Urkel was more likable than the baby? Seriously, he never stops talking. And sure, there are occasions where I can get a giggle out of him. Like in a later episode that's also a two-parter. My cookie's gone. Because you ate it. No, the cookie creature took it. Oh, right. A cookie creature took it. Don't talk down to me! This is between you and the cookie creature, so you two will have to work it out. Ah, oh, well thanks for nothing! Like, he can be clever, and he had that one kind of funny music video. I'm the baby, gotta love me. Big purple eyes, I'm very cuddly. Especially when I hit my daddy with a flying pin. But most of the time, he rubs me off the wrong way. Like, he's there for merchandising only. And since he's literally a baby, it's not like he has anything else to do but make baby jokes. The cave people are funnier than him. Yes, there are cave people in this world. But even if we ignore the baby, 
Didn't the show just do an episode about a parent in a midlife crisis? At least the gags are different. Like, it takes a long time. And I mean, a long time for Earl to realize that she's overworked. And that he needs to help her. Mama, not the mama. You do that one more time and I'm gonna throw you across the room. Not the mama. Ah! Wee, <laughs> that felt better. But it turns out she's unhappy because of him. Possibly because of the breakdown Earl had a year ago, and the extra work of caring for the baby. So what suggestion does his friend Roy give him? When was the last time you did the mating dance for your wife? What are you talking about? The mating dance. The ultimate expression of a male's absolute commitment to a female. I... Got nothing. This show just keeps finding ways of bringing in adult topics. The lesson here is, satisfy your frustrated partner with sex. Even if this example isn't actual sex, the implication is there. But the important takeaway is that Earl needs to step up as a father. That's Franz's desire to mating dance. Okay, I'm not gonna sum up every episode, but I would like to occasionally bring up some highlights and oddities. Like Hurling Day, where we get the first appearance of Grandma Ethel, voiced by Florence Stanley, who honestly is my favorite character in this. Mostly because of who voices her, and she does have some of the funniest lines. This is man, Robbie. Man's not a pet. Man's one of nature's mistakes. Ethel? And here comes the other one. I don't know where your hands have been. It's too fast. No! You're driving too fast. I don't like it when it's too fast. No! Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? Anyway, she has to be tossed into a tar pit for a peaceful death, as per dinosaur tradition. It's messed up, but it's a possible allegory for how some human families have a twisted way of treating their members. Maybe this episode is also meant to explore a what-if scenario of a more toxic, ageist lifestyle of society. Fortunately, Grandma avoids her fate in the tar pit because Earl learns that elders could teach the next generation a thing or two. And Ethel herself discovers that she still has a lot of life left to live. I am not letting your mother move into my house and spend the rest of her days making my life miserable. Take me home, dear. Her intergenerational interactions with Robbie are especially heartwarming. Speaking of Robbie, I can't say he's like Eddie Winslow, since he does seem like a smart kid, always questioning social norms, as we'll see in later seasons. Though compared to Charlene, his development isn't as noteworthy as her. I mean, Charlene starts out somewhat materialistic, always wanting things and needing to achieve popularity in school. What's this about a coat? Oh, it's only the most beautiful coat in the world, and it only costs $500. But Daddy won't let me have it because of meanness. But over time, she actually mellows out to where she wants to help others and not make it about herself. Out of everyone, I'd say her development is everlasting throughout the show. Getting back on topic, in episode 4, Earl is challenged by another dinosaur, and whoever wins will gain possession of Fran and family. I mean, that's very much something animals do regarding territory, but you'd think they'd grow out of that after becoming civilized and all. Still, it's funny seeing Earl trying to battle a giant leg. Then, in the Season 1 finale, Robbie learns about a special ritual that young dinosaurs take part in with adults as a coming-of-age marker. But he doesn't feel like doing it at all, since it makes no sense to him. But it just doesn't make sense, Dad. Today I'm just a kid. But tomorrow I climb up the mountain and yell at the moon, and that makes me a grown-up? Why? Because your mother sent out 150 invitations and we got a dead rhino and 10 tons of potato salad downstairs. So tomorrow night, you are going to scamper your scaly butt up that hill and howl like a banshee. Uh, 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 ow!
It's like if the one atheist in the family started questioning their religious family about why bad things happen when they don't do the rituals. So of course, by not doing it, the whole family starts being spooked. Don't you hear it? It's the ice maker. Quiet, you! You brought about a cataclysm against all life on Earth, and I don't want to hear any more out of you! Okay. Are we dead yet? No, dear. Hmm. When are we gonna be dead? Not until season four, you little munchkin. But despite everyone going insane because of one rebellious teenager's refusal to howl, Robbie changes his mind after seeing Earl and Roy arguing with each other. So the lesson is, conform to societal norms even if they don't make sense. Or else your father and his best friend will fight like idiots. Still, I'll give them this moment. I'm sorry I gave you a hard time about the pen and pencil set. I know that wasn't too original, but I don't have any kids of my own, so I wanted Robbie to have the pen and pencil set my dad gave me on my howling day. Roy, your dad gave you this? Yeah. It's the one his dad gave to him on his howling day. Oh, jeez. Oh. <laughs> and so Robbie finds his reason to howl. Only by howling do we defeat the dark spirit which would turn dinosaur against dinosaur and bring an end to our days on Earth. So the first season was a little weird. It had plenty of awkward dino bits that did not come out right. But between the dinosaur animatronics and the sentimentality, it's got some charm. But it's the next season where things get intriguing. Now see, when you go to like a Wikipedia entry for The Simpsons, you can easily get lost in all of the political, media, and religious themes that the show covered in its run. But it's not just that. The enduring appeal of the show comes from its takes on said topics being relevant even today even if some parts of it are very dated. I get a similar feeling with dinosaurs. Already, we see corporations running the world, but you know how every dinosaur acts like a carnivore, even if their species isn't considered one? Well, in episode 8, the dinosaurs berate Robbie when he says he doesn't feel like a meat-eater, and they say that even openly admitting this is a bad thing. It's television. They say whatever they want. Television is responsible for the utter degradation of our society. Well, that too. And when they say that eating veggies is like drug abuse, they weren't kidding. <gasps> Broccoli! I could have understood a carrot or a little lettuce, maybe, but right to broccoli? No, my son is an herbivore. I'm sure Robbie doesn't even know what it is. He gets it from your side, Fran. What? Your Uncle Elmo, the one they never talk about? He ain't off the wrong side of the plate. <sighs> if only my cooking had been better, he wouldn't have turned to this. <laughs> of course, this could also be a metaphor for how young teens start coming out and the like. Especially when Robbie gives a speech about how they shouldn't be judged by what they eat. Why do I have to be anything? I have a dream that someday a dinosaur will be judged not by the content of his lunchbox, but by the quality of his character. All right. Yeah. Right, huh? The Jim Henson Company was very progressive for its time. So even though the ultimate lesson of this episode is more about accepting and respecting differences, this is an instance of getting crap past the radar. The message would have flown over my head as a kid, and I could have caught on if I were a little older, but as an adult, I can slowly recognize how crafty this show can get. The cave people are supposedly the stand-ins for indigenous groups who are treated as subhuman. Well, sub-dinosaur in this case. I mean, the TMNT parody poster should make that obvious. And in Employee of the Month, Robbie refuses to dissect a living cave person. I didn't come up with that. In the end, he takes her home because he wants to keep her. Do you and say, <laughs> huh? Uh, he followed me home? Oh, can we keep him? Please, 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 please. 
This is not a pet. This is a wild animal. It's dirty and disgusting and doesn't know how to live indoors. Oh, come on, Dad. See? Oh, oh, oh. We'll wash him and we'll feed him and everything. Yeah, you won't even know he's here. No. They breed like rabbits. If it wasn't for us being around, they'd overrun the entire Earth. Yeah, can't imagine a world full of people. That would be ridiculous. The third season is where the indigenous analogy comes more into focus. Earl discovers a supposedly unclaimed area, but he later finds it populated with cave people. Guess what reference they go with? Well, usually a find like this is followed by an expansion of the dinosaur empire, mm -hmm. which ruthlessly and mercilessly crushes any form of life standing in its path. Listen here, Mr. Knee-Jerk Left-Wing World Domination poo pooer It so happens that there's nothing out there to ruin. Just some rocks and shrubs and cavemen. It's their land. They were there first. They're animals. They may be smaller than us, but I can't think of a creature more bloodthirsty and savage. Coming from you, that's a lot to claim. It gets even better when Robbie meets a dinosaur who has been living with the cave people for a long time, and he learns about the comfortable lives of said people prior to the dinosaurs coming over. This convinces the teenage dino to stand up for those different from him. But in the end, Earl leaves the land alone, since the taxes he'll pay exceeds what he will earn from seizing it. Hypothetically speaking, if this land belonged to a say cave people yeah since they're not citizens and they don't even legally exist you couldn't tax them could you well actually no yes <laughs> dad dad look they're decent creatures and if you let them keep their land you give them the chance to live with dignity and peace and harmony with nature for generations to come that's really being somebody dad plus that's 11 million dollars the government will never see i guess this belongs to you. Today, he says, you have done a noble thing. He says, today will always be remembered for the generosity of the large plaid one. <laughs> <laughs> now, going back to season two, there's an obligatory PSA episode where dinosaurs can address an ongoing issue in society. In this case, it's a drug PSA involving leaves that make Robbie and Earl high as balls. This leads to some shenanigans that no PSA would have. It's like reaching the moon or composing a tune. It's a most unusual day. It's a most unusual time. I keep feeling my temperature climb. If my heart's not behaving the usual way, then You are all weirdos! <laughs> but much like real life, misuse of drugs can result in losing your job and ruining your life in more ways than one. But just as everyone says at the end of the episode, without screwing the fourth wall whatsoever, don't use drugs. You see, folks, drugs are a major problem in our society. Thanks. Drugs ruin lives, divide families, and lead to heavy-handed preachy sitcom episodes like this one. Of course, we managed to keep it delightfully funny and upbeat, but other shows aren't so lucky. Oh, come on. I know sitcoms with funny, upbeat PSAs, like Family Matters. God, Josie, you should have given them the stupid shoes. Somebody call 911! Okay, you got a point. Another drug PSA comes in during the third season, where Robbie consumes thornoroids, creatures that insult you while adding muscle into your diet. Problem, you puny runt? Chicken! Listen, do you guys really work? Can, can you really make me stronger? Oh, make me stronger, make me stronger, you pathetic! Go home and take a nap, you mama's boy! And yeah, they work. He's strong enough to lift the fridge. But the drugs get addictive, and they will slowly change the consumer. Robbie's personality changes, and his body becomes spiky as a result of these little creatures. Thankfully, he sees what a monster he's becoming, and Spike is able to stay with him until he reverts to his original self. 
At least he can still apologize to his family. I'm sorry for everything I said, and I'll do anything to make it up to you. Anything, huh? Anything. Would you... Move the fridge for me? So, no lesson learned? I'd say that's a rare occurrence, but otherwise, the show found ways to be blatant about what it's picking on. Like how easily led people are with warmongering politicians, but still be funny. They don't always land, but even so, it's very relevant in this day and age that we'd have people like this still around. It's almost brilliant, really, and I wonder how far they could have gone if it had lasted longer. But all things must come to an end, as Season 4 only has 14 episodes. Half of them aired on ABC, while the rest came from syndication through local stations and the Disney Channel. The finale is... something else. And it answers the immortal question... What killed the dinosaurs? It starts with an overgrowth of these cider poppies, which only happened because the beetles responsible for eating them have gone extinct. And they are extinct because a We Say So Wax Fruit Factory destroyed their habitat. Earl, as a We Say So employee, tries defending his company's actions, as he also says, Progress is good. It's progress that put electricity in the toothbrush. Progress put potato chips in a tennis ball can. That oh, cool. sure, some sacrifices had to be made along the way. Great. A forest here, a few species there. But in the end, wouldn't you trade all that for great advancements like, uh, like, uh, do, oh, like, like, uh, microwave toast? Yeah. Great. Yeah, you want to talk about progress? This takes all the guesswork out of making toast. Richfield puts Earl on a task force to remove the cider poppies with poison which proceeds to kill every other plant in the world. So to fix that mess, the corporation invents dance powder to make it rain in their part of the world, at the cost of drying out every other region in Pangea, and causing an all-out war between the dinosaurs. Yeah, I'm just screwing with you. To make it rain, the dinos decide to bomb the volcanoes. Why? They spew off big puffy clouds whenever they erupt. So all we gotta do is set off a whole bunch of volcanoes! There is logic in what he says. Earl goes through with this plan, despite earlier misgivings, and because of his stupidity, the sulfur clouds will now cover the Earth for at least 10,000 years. Nothing but snow will fall until then, and a dinosaur civilization will cease to be. And in a case of this show being far too real and ahead of its time, Richfield is not concerned about this one bit. Oh, don't turn it to one of those environmental doomsayers, Sinclair. Boo-hoo, it's raining acid. There's a hole in the ozone. You're hurting Flipper. Bah, bunch of tree-hugging panty wastes. They're always standing in the way of progress, and it's our job to pave right over them. Well, I think you're missing the point, sir. The world may be coming to an end! Well, that's a fourth quarter problem. We'll drop a bomb on that bridge when we come to it. Right now, my biggest problem is trying to figure out what to do with all this money! <laughs> if you've watched my show for long enough, you know that I don't have a very high opinion on corporations. And this is why. Thus the realization that Earl doomed them all to a frigid death. He makes one of the saddest speeches in a show made for family television. Now it looks like there won't be much of a world left for you or your brother and sister to live in. Are we gonna move? Well, no. There's no place to move to. This is the only world we got. Well, what's gonna happen to us? Well, I don't exactly know. But whatever it is, nobody's gonna leave you. That's right, little guy. We'll all stay together. Yeah, yeah, and hey, I'm sure it'll all work out okay. Yeah. After all, dinosaurs have been on this earth for 150 million years. And it's not like we're gonna just disappear.
And as the DNN host says... This is Howard Hand Up Me. Good night. Goodbye. Honestly, even if this is supposed to be just another episode, which was originally the plan, I don't know how they would get out of this one. It would take some fanfic-level shenanigans to return to the status quo, like Urkel coming from the future and somehow pulling it off. Still, out of all these episodes in the entire show, this one easily stands out the most. In a moment when we expected witty humor, the finale took our expectations and savagely subverted it. Its tragic conclusion makes the experience bittersweet and memorable. Dinosaurs is not perfect, obviously, but it had the love and charm of the Jim Henson Company that we've all come to expect. It was filled with personality and uniqueness that couldn't be possibly matched, and I marvel at the craftiness and subtlety in its approach to topics ranging from sexual harassment, animal abuse, and even racism. From what I can find, it only ended due to executives not wanting to continually pay a high amount of money to run the show. This wasn't like your normal sitcom, after all. They all used state-of-the-art animatronics and computer-generated effects a lot, which was why they wanted lower costs. I hear ratings might have been low later in its run, though they seemed fine enough not to be the cause. I'm sad I didn't see this during its initial run, or any reruns after the fact. I'm not sure if Disney Plus has them, but the series has been released in its entirety on DVD. If you can get a hold of it, I would recommend giving it a watch. In these desperate times, we can all use a good laugh, even if, ironically, it comes from literal dinosaurs. Boy, TV's just as good as I remember it. Again! <laughs> I'm the Media Hunter. Media's my prey, and reviewing them my way. So the show seems to have a children's aesthetic. Yet the dialogue is unquestionably sharp-edged, witty, and thematically skewed to adults. 